Hello again. I thought with this podcast, what I do is step back a little bit from just wildlife photography and talk more generally about nature photography. Um, essentially, what you need to think about are the same sorts of things, but I thought I'd step back a little bit because I do um, photograph other things in nature. I do quite like landscapes and um, also things like flowers, although I don't, to be honest, I don't shoot them very often. So I thought I'd just step back and look at any of those categories. So if we're, if we're thinking nature photography is probably the better description of what I'm talking about here. So before you do any photography, you, there are certain things you need to think about. And one of the things that I talk about a lot, if you've listened to my webinars or been on the webinar, uh, the webinars that I give, planning is a really big part of it. So you've really got to think about, first of all, the environment that you're going to. And with nature photography, so this is going to be pretty much exclusively outdoors. Um, I mean, you might be shooting nature in your home, but <laughs> that, that's probably not the ideal situation. So good luck with that. Um, the big things you've got, first of all, weather, because if you're planning your shoot, you need to be aware of what weather to expect. And depending on what weather you've got, what additional things you need to think about. And I'll dive into that in a moment. The other big thing you have when you're outside is changing light. Now, this will relate to um, time of day. So I'm going to talk about that. The best times of day, perhaps, to take different types of photographs. Um, also, though, if you've got if you're going out on a day where there's a lot of cloud and it's a bit windy, um, you'll find that light may change as clouds come over and disappear again. And if you're in something like a wooded environment where you've got maybe um, very strong sunlight. Um, above the trees, but you're in the woods somewhere, in the forest, wherever you are, you might find you have these bands of um, quite contrasting light and dark. So all of that takes you back to the impact that will have on the right exposure you need. So that also depends on the best way to set your camera. So I'm going to talk about these things. Um, finally, obviously, you're in an uncontrolled environment anyway, as I've just described. And Wildlife will tend to do its own thing. So the thing with wildlife, I think fundamentally, is to first of all understand as much as you can about the animal or animals you're trying to photograph so that you understand their behaviours, what they do at different times of day, what kind of behaviours you're likely to witness, sometimes if you're lucky, um, but what you're likely to witness at the time of day that you're planning to be there. And also just be where they do their own thing. So um, you might get nothing, you might not see them at all. Uh, animals will definitely be aware of you before you're aware of them. That In 90% plus of, of cases, that's what happens. So you need to be very wary of that when you're in their environment. Okay, so let's just look at um, planning your shoot first of all. So I'm going to talk about the location um, where you are. So ignoring things like cloud and, and all this sort of stuff, the time of day will have a big, a big impact on the quality of the light. And obviously with photography, we are using light. So light is the most important element of what we're, um, what we have to think about when we're um, shooting photographs of wildlife. So we have the golden hour and that's generally regarded as the hour after sunrise. So once the sun is up, and then the hour before sunset. And the reason they're referred to as the golden hour is you tend to get these stronger oranges and reds and, and golds, and golds, not gold, golds in the light. And that's caused by the, the light from the sun going through more and more air as it gets lower from our perspective on the horizon. So it's having to get through more air to get to our, our eye and dust and other things. And that changes the the colour that we see and the colour that our camera will see. So for that reason, a lot of photographers, nature photographers, like to shoot in the morning, early in the morning, or late in the afternoon, evening, depending on when sunrise and sunset happen, where you are and at that time of year. Um, so the other aspect, if you bring wildlife into the equation, often wildlife will be more active at those times. Certainly hunters tend to hunt, um, or will often be 
around at those times. I mean, kangaroos, when I rode around Australia on a motorbike, uh, kangaroos tend to be more active at dusk and dawn. So if I didn't want to get hit by a kangaroo leaping across the road and then getting followed by his mates while I was on my motorbike, um, I would tend to avoid going out at those times of day. But conversely, as a photographer, I wanted to get pictures of kangaroos. They're the best time. So just be aware of that. So research that your subject, if it is an animal, and look at when they're active. Um, of course, that does mean that if you're not a morning person, you might have to just set yourself up for getting up at 5 a.m. to get out and photograph animals. And that was one of the things that, in fact, I've done this quite a lot, um, photograph your wildlife, depending on where I've been. Um, certainly in India, where I was up at 5 pretty regularly to grab some breakfast and then get out so that I could be out early to photograph tigers. So that's the first thing to consider, really. And, and it's the most important, I suppose, in terms of what light are you going to have to contend with at the ideal time to capture your subject? Because that has an impact not only on your alarm clock setting, um, but also on the, the gear that you need to take with you and how you need to use it. So we'll look at that next. So obviously, the first thing is your camera. I'm assuming you've got a DSLR or a mirrorless camera. They're likely to give you the best results in these scenarios. Having said that, for landscapes, I can, I'll can i often use my smartphone. And your smartphone probably has a panorama mode. And that can be really good. Um, modern phones are, are very good now at shooting things like panoramas. And they can give you a perspective and a result that you can't get easily with a DSLR. So don't write your smartphone off, but I tend to regard it as a sort of secondary camera, uh, which will give me a different set of results to what I can get on my DSLR. So that's the first thing. Second thing is lenses. Now, ideally for general nature photography, uh, you're going to want a combination of a wide angle zoom and a telephoto zoom. So what I mean by the wide angle is something that will give you these very wide shots so typically I'm thinking of landscape photography uh, where you've got a very wide view um, and the telephoto will allow you to get in close and that would be more for animal photography bird photography that kind of thing um, having said that you can always cross them over there's no hard and fast rules but they're the general recommendations so the camera to give you an idea of the sort of range that you might want to think about, although you don't need to think about this sort of range. But the focal length range I normally work with on two cameras, uh, sorry, two lenses, is 28 millimeter focal length up to 400. Now that's across two lenses, which is a 28 to 135 wide angle zoom and a 100 to 400 telephoto zoom. So they're my go-to lenses. Now that's for a full frame camera. If you don't know the difference between a full frame and a cropped camera, I'm not really going to go into that here, but there's plenty of places you can find that out or you can do my course and I definitely explain it there. But if you're using a cropped sensor, you won't, the, the numbers will just change, they'll shift slightly, they'll shift smaller slightly. So you might be looking at an 18 um, rather than 28 mil to give you the same result. Um, you probably won't want to go up to 400, uh, but what you come down to in the end is what lenses do you have now, which is a great place to start. If you're thinking about buying new lenses or even new equipment, just get, be, <clears throat> excuse me, make sure that you do understand what your current equipment will give you if, you, if you have current equipment. And be very, and most importantly, be aware of what it's not giving you. So what are, where the, which areas are the areas where your current gear, if you're thinking of replacing anything, is not delivering. So it might be that you don't have long enough focal length to really get the detail um, in the subject that you're shooting. It may be that the camera response is too slow. It might be noisy. Um, it might um, not have a very fast, um, or very good burst sequence. So if you're photographing a moving animal, I'll always shoot in bursts. So I get a um, whole series of uh, images just by holding the shutter down so these kind of things you need to understand if you don't understand any of that it's i would recommend investing in a bit of training so that you do understand 
certainly for the style of photography you want to do, you do understand what the, the kind of norms are, what the benchmarks are, and then you can decide how much you want to deviate from those benchmarks based on the equipment that you're using and the sort of environments you're shooting in. So hopefully that's helped a bit on the gear. But the first gear obviously is camera and lenses. That's what everybody thinks about. But you might also need to think about protection from rain. So if you're in an environment that's wet, um, I use a splash protector and that will fit over my telephoto and the body of the camera and that keeps the water off. So I can use the camera quite happily in a wet environment and not worry about water getting onto the camera, more importantly into the electronics or anywhere else where it's going to be a problem. Um, you might also be in a dusty environment, so you need to think about that because I've had problems with dust getting between my camera body and the lens and the sensor and the, the electronics stop working together. So if you're in an environment that is in any way going to be harsh towards the camera, do think about protection. And also for yourself, because you're likely to be out in this environment all day or for certainly for quite a few hours, particularly if you've had to get up early and go out there. So it might be cold, it might be hot, uh, you might need a drink with you, um, all of these things, so all of the things I'm talking about with the camera, so rain and dust, think about yourself as well. Make sure that you have the right kind of clothing on and that you're comfortable when you're doing your shoot because um, it is pretty miserable sitting there for hours waiting for something to happen and it might not and you're cold and wet and, you, you know, you're just kind of questioning why you really did set that alarm for five o'clock that morning. So, they're probably the two major things, um, clothing, protecting your gear, protecting yourself. Always make sure that you've got sufficient batteries. I mean, I have two batteries in my camera anyway, and I make sure they're uh, both fully charged before I go. Uh, they, I've never run them down on a single shoot, the, the pair of them, so it means I've got a backup. But if for any reason one of them isn't working so well, and batteries will degrade in their performance over time. So if you've got old ba an old battery in your camera, um, do, just be aware of how long, how well it's lasting, how many photographs it will give you. If it's starting to get a bit low, think about replacing it. Um, SD cards. So again, I've got really big cards in my camera. So when I buy a new camera body, uh, I will buy the biggest cards and mine take SD and um, flash drive. Um, and I'll get the biggest ones that it will support. Uh, the reason is that new cards will come out, and I have been called out by this before. When I've had an older body, I bought a large, um, I'm thinking of an old Canon um, EOS 1 that I had, EOS 1D, and I had a one um, gigabyte memory card, and I wanted to put four in there. And when I put the four in, uh, the camera couldn't read it because the software wasn't up to date. Now, as it happened, because I was um, a professional photographer in Sydney, I was able to drop into Canon in Sydney, and they did an upgrade on the camera, a software update on the camera body for me, so I could then use the, the bigger card. But you might not be in that situation, and you don't want to spend money on cards, because they can get expensive, and then find the camera can't read them. So when I buy the camera new, I buy the biggest thing that it will support, and generally that's good enough. I mean, certainly these days... Um, because I clean my cards regularly. I get, once I've done the shoot, I get everything off the camera onto a laptop, maybe um, a portable solid state drive if I'm away. And as soon as I'm home, they go onto my um, storage drives. So I don't keep anything long term on the cards in my camera. So I generally don't need a backup card, having said all of that, but it is useful perhaps to have one depending on what you've actually got. So Another thing that I would recommend is if you do have a bit of gear together and you're having to walk to or hike to where you're going to be doing your um, shoot, make sure you've got a good quality backpack. And what I mean by that is one that has hip straps because what they do, they drop the weight of the pack onto your hips and it's not that it's the weight isn't on your shoulders. And um I don't know about you, but my back is not as happy with me as it used to be. So I, to be comfortable, I, I like to use, I like only use um, backpacks with a hip strap now because it just drops that weight low, help, it, it's just much more comfortable. I can walk for miles with a fully loaded backpack and it's fine. Um, so 
I do recommend that. And bearing in mind that what you're carrying is your possibly, probably your camera, one or two lenses, uh, maybe a, a raincoat, maybe some water, sunscreen, um, hat if you're not wearing it, uh, all these kinds of things. Maybe even a little bit of first aid in case you have a bit of a mishap. So think about that. Um, again, I'm not, I'm not proposing that you go out and buy an awful lot of new gear, but I would just I'm sort of suggesting these as a benchmark. And then you can look at what you've currently got and decide where it works well and where it doesn't work so well. And then you can fill the gaps. So I'm um, I'm not one for buying lots and lots of equipment for, for no good reason. I'll only buy it if I'm really confident that this is what I need. Um, another thing to think about is um, just on the gear side, if you're doing landscapes and particularly if you're going to be using um, slower shutter speeds so longer exposures uh, you might want to think about a tripod you might want to think about cable release or a remote release of some sort now remember with most cameras if you look at the self timer options generally you've got two one of them is 10 seconds the other one is three seconds usually that it might be slightly different on your gear but you generally got um, uh, timer settings in that, that those sort of areas so the 10 second one is designed or intended if you're taking um, a photograph and you want to get yourself in the whoops in the photograph so it gives you time to press the shutter button then run around in front of the lens get into whatever pose you're going for and then the camera will take that picture for you so that's the 10 second the three second allows you to press the shutter button and then the if the camera is moved in any way and it might be a very slight movement but depending on the lens and shutter speed combination you're using that can show up in the image. So those three seconds give the camera adequate time to just settle again. So while the shutter is open, there's no movement. So you don't need a cable release or a re remote release necessarily. And it maybe is one less thing to carry or to forget. <laughs> um, so there is a backup there. So again, it's about familiarity with your equipment, with your camera equipment, and what it will give you, not only in terms of taking the image, but what it gives you in terms of options when you're taking the image. So um, do make sure you're aware of uh, what your camera gear will give you. Okay, so the next thing I want to talk about is um, more the environment. So I've already spoke about it being an uncontrolled environment and you, I'm assuming you're outside, so you've got weather to deal with, um, time of day. I've already spoken about a little bit. The thing to remember about the middle of the day if it's bright sunshine, you've got, a very, you've got a very harsh light. So generally, it's more or less overhead <clears throat> to some degree. So that's going to affect the shadows that you get, if, particularly if you're shooting animals or anything that casts a shadow will, will give an effect. But it means that trying to get an animal's eye can be very difficult because the, the um, eyebrows and the, the, the whole area or structure around the eye is designed to provide some shade. So... Um, if it's a harsh, if it's harsh sunlight, your subject is likely to try and keep his eyes out of the direct sun anyway to stop being blinded. Particularly as the animal might be having to be aware of its environment so it doesn't get eaten. Essentially, so you know, very high on the priority list for it. Um, the other thing about that harsh sunlight, it will tend to bleach things out. So if you're looking for a great colour shot, middle of, the, middle of the day is probably the worst time to shoot other than possibly middle of the night. Um, but this is why that the golden hours, so the, go, the um, time, the, the one hour basically, or hour or so after sunrise, the hour or so before sunset, as I've already explained, they give you those orangey colours, those red hues, and they can um, uh, create really atmospheric images. So it's something to think about. And um, the other thing about shooting early in the day, uh, and this is where a tripod might come in handy, is you often get this mist, depending on where you are on the time of year. But if it's if there's water around, whether it be a river or um, just even from dew on the ground, you can it can at some point turn into a sort of mist. And if you've got an animal in there with a, a sort of red sun, you know, hue from the uh, the sunshine, um, that can look pretty amazing. So. Again, getting out a bit early might not be your favourite occupation, but it can really give you great results uh, if you get a, have a bit of luck as well and you're prepared for what you might see. So, the, you know, being prepared is really the whole watchword with this. Be, 
prepared for eventualities, put yourself in a situation where you've got the best chance of capturing that kind of image and know your equipment so that you technically know how to do it because that's that's really important. Um, if you are in, so doing just nature generally or in parks or wherever, just please respect the environment you're in, even in your own garden actually. Um, you know, stay off the paths. Um, oh, sorry, keep to the paths, I should say, not stay off them. Keep to the paths, um, particularly areas where a lot of people go because um, animals will tend to congregate where they feel relatively safe. And if people just walk everywhere and ignore the paths, what you're going to do is you tend to drive the wildlife away. They'll go somewhere else where they, they feel comfortable. So this is one of the reasons for staying on the paths. It also means the um, any flowers, plants, anything else that's around that the animals use um, for cover or for food, um, they don't get trodden flat by you know hundreds of tourists wandering through, taking you know armed with massive um, telephoto lenses on their cameras. So do stick to paths, and even in, if it's your back garden, I, I recommend sticking to certain areas. I'm, I'm recording this in February and uh 2024 and um i did manage to get my grass cut uh earlier in the week and one of the things i did note it's the first cut of the year but i could very clearly see where the animal runs are um so they so i live in uh, the edge of a small town in um southwest france so it's quite rural here and i get wildlife coming into the garden quite regularly but there are certain runs i can see they use so they're areas that i'll just stay away from and um, I like to create kind of nature spots that I don't do anything with, just so that animals um, have uh, places to come and uh, come into my my garden and feel safe. And then I can, you know, I get the pleasure of watching them. So, um, yeah, do do respect um, where you are. And there's the old adage, um, I, can't, I can never remember which way around it is, but um, take only photographs, leave only footprints. And if you can minimise the footprints, that's even better. Okay, so um, with animals, if you are photographing wildlife, probably the the biggest thing to remember is that with an animal, things can happen really fast. So there's two things there. First of all, you've got to be paying attention. You've got to be watching what's going on. If if you doze off, that's when it's all going to happen. So that's the first thing. Second thing is on the camera itself, um, you want to have a fast shutter speed. Now, I just... I generally talk in terms of if you're talking thousandths of a second, you're completely freezing the action. If you're talking hundredths of a second, you're reducing the movement to a large degree, but you might have some movement remaining depending on where you are in the hundredths of a second. And if you're in tenths of a second or slower, you're then talking longer exposure. So you're likely to have a lot a lot more movement in there if there are things going on. In fact, if you're looking at landscape, I'm going to come back to landscape, but I'll just say what I think of it. Um, do be aware that even though you're not photographing animals that are running about, you might still have movement from wind or breezes, those kind of things. So that can show up in the photo. Think about that. So getting back to the animal, though, um, I would recommend, um, I tend to shoot in thousandths of a second. You might want to go to shutter speed priority on the camera mode. Uh, uh, yeah, on the camera mode. Um, but yeah, pay attention and, and just be ready uh, to go and don't do the chimping thing where you take a photograph you look at it and of course then something even more exciting happens and you're not ready at all uh, if you want to practice photographing wildlife and you and you don't live in um, a safari park somewhere or you know a, a national park or a reserve uh, birds are a great subject um, for a couple of reasons one is they're everywhere so you've got to be really unlucky if you live somewhere where there are no birds at all. The other reason they're really good, though, is they're quite tricky to photograph because most of the time, if they're flying, they're going to be quite small. So it's quite difficult. It can be difficult for autofocus to find them, particularly if they're flying with things like buildings behind them. And, um, you know, you've, so this means you've got to be able to master your autofocus. So they're a great practice for that. Um, telephoto... The ideal length, I think, generally um, for, for bird photographs is 600 mil because it allows you to get in really close. But a 600 mil lens is, in, in most cases, pretty heavy. It's very hard, if not, well, it's, I'm not going to say it's impossible, but it's very hard to handhold a 600 and keep it steady enough um, to get a good photograph because 
something that long, you need um, at least to be shooting at one six hundredth of a second. And I would recommend going faster than that. But of course, as you go faster, you reduce the amount of light coming in. So unless it's a very large aperture lens, which makes it even heavier and bigger, you you get these problems with the trade-off between um, ISO and aperture. And then, of course, with aperture, you think in depth of field. So basically, bottom line, bird's tricky. So practice as much as you can. And that will really help you get to know your camera. And that's the other really important thing when you do this is to know your camera, particularly with wildlife. Because if something just kicks off and it happens fast, you don't want to be fiddling around trying to remember how to set it up because you've missed everything. So you've really got to just instinctively know um, what to do and also preset your camera as much as you can. So things like aperture, make sure you're getting a good exposure. If you're in an environment where the light is changing, it might be it's cloudy. It could be that you're just at that time of day. It could be golden hour, one of the golden hours. And, um, of course, the light is reducing or increasing steadily, but your eye is adjusting automatically as well. So you may not be conscious that the actual amount of light that the camera is able to handle is changing almost by the minute, pretty much. So... The best way to handle that is to just test, take test photos every now and again, just to look at the exposure and then compensate with ISO or aperture or whatever you're doing, shutter speed, whatever you need to do to just keep that exposure um, correct. In post-processing, you can recover a photograph that where the exposure isn't correct, but you're going to get issues with it to a greater or lesser degree. So I don't recommend it. Uh, particularly if it's something that you want to really blow up and do a high quality print of. So you want to give yourself the best possible um, chances of getting a good result. And the, the, one of the best ways of doing that is to um, just keep checking your exposure and make sure that your settings are right and then do it again every a few minutes later. Okay, but yeah, so for animals, I think they're the key things. I mean, know your gear is absolutely fundamental regardless of what you're, you're photographing. But pay attention, be patient, be ready to move quickly. Um, if you want to capture the action, be have your camera set to quite a fast shutter speed. You'll be the best judge of that, given the gear you have and the situation that you're in and the result you're going for. Um, but that is definitely um, my recommendation there. Another thing that I do suggest when people are photogra- photographing wildlife is to just have a look around, look at um, Instagram, look at other things on the web, Um, BBC, some of the wildlife shows and look at how they're photographing the animal that you want to photograph and that might give you some ideas about composition, the kind of photograph you want to get. Make sure you know how to achieve those as well. So again, practice is um, a a really good thing to do before you go. Okay, so another thing that I do take photographs of occasionally, um, but they're worth mentioning because they bring up another aspect of um, well, photography in general, but certainly nature photography, and that's plants. And the key thing with photographing plants is depth of field because often you'll have a plant or a flower or whatever it is, and it's in the middle of a lot of other plant flowers. And one of the things that you, you want to do with a good photograph is to draw the viewer's eye to your subject. Now, you might take them on a little journey through the photograph. You might use leading lines or or something else to kind of take them through that image towards your subject. But however you do that, you do want it to be very clear what the subject is. And this is one of the most common mistakes that a lot of photographers make, particularly new photographers. When you look at their work, it's fine you know, nicely exposed, um, good lighting, colour, all the rest, but you've no idea what you're supposed to be looking at. So depth of field is a great way of drawing the viewer's eye towards your subject and making it clear what the subject is. And that's particularly important where you're photographing one particular thing to a plant in this instance that could be among a group of plants and you want to pick out one individual plant. So that will, and depth of field is a really important element of that overall composition to achieve that so you might need to have a tripod depending on what you're using and um, the kind of shutter speed you're using and all of that stuff you will need to be aware of things like breezes and movement because they may not be that obvious when you're looking at your subject but if you take um, 
a, a longish exposure, let's say um, a tenth of a second exposure, there might be some movement in that, just from a just slight movement from a breeze or or wind, whatever's going on there. So um, what you might want to think about is using aperture priority mode because that does prioritize uh, the aperture, which of course controls your depth of field. And to be honest with you, normally when I'm photographing, um, this is wildlife because it's mostly what I'm photographing, but photographing anything, I tend to use aperture priority. So that's my favorite because in addition to freezing the action, I also want to control depth of field so that anyone viewing my photographs is drawn to the subject unless the background is very neutral. So in the case of a, a, a breaching humpback whale, if it's just sea and sky behind, it doesn't really matter whether that's in focus or not. It's not going to have a big impact on the image. But if there's a lot of detail, let's say cliffs or something and um, a suburb in the background, you kind of want that uh, out of focus to some extent because otherwise you get a very busy image and that's probably what not what you want to go for. So, um, yeah, plants are quite good as a practice subject as well, just for something, even if you don't normally photograph plants, it's just another way of getting creative with your photography and trying something different. So I do recommend once you finish shooting birds, have a go at some plants as well, and then you've kind of covered both ends of the, the movement spectrum from that sense. The final thing I'm going to talk about is landscapes. And I've already mentioned using your smartphone because that can give you a different result. And um, one of the things I like about landscapes is that it's always a challenge to put a different spin on them, try and come up with a composition or a way of looking at a subject which is different to how you you would normally see them or what, to what you might expect. So that's why I like uh, the smartphone because you can do quite a long, narrow panoramic shot. Uh, which I quite like. They're just different. <clears throat> but the other, probably with if you're looking at DSLRs and mirrorless, the way you can make the real changes are coming back again to what I've already spoken about, time of day and um, how you compose the image. So obviously, time, obviously lighting is the key again. And dawn and dusk are great because you've got this amazing lighting and also um, perhaps more so at dawn you might get mist and things like that going on. So that can add another element to your photograph. And this is where if you use a very long exposure, that mist might become more ethereal as well. So just it's a great thing to experiment with and just see what results you can get. Um, one thing to remember, particularly with sunsets, and I remember this very clearly years ago, I was at um, Ayers Rock in um, Australia and I was photographing Ayers Rock at sunset. So everyone's lined up because the the rock the color of the rock changes as the light changes so it's because it's um, it's kind of a touristy thing to do but that's why people do it so i was shooting all of that and then i turned around and i realized that the really big picture was actually behind me and this was just as the sun was disappearing below the horizon and we had a bit of cloud cover but it wasn't on the horizon it was above the horizon so nearer me and the the clouds were being lit up from below by the setting sun and in fact if you get that kind of effect you can get these amazing oranges and reds and all the rest but remember that that effect will continue even once the sun has gone down so once the sun itself has dropped below the horizon you're still going to get those colors for a little while a few minutes um while it you know sort of slides while the earth rotates i guess you know um, a bit further and then it's no you no longer get that sunlight on the clouds but do remember that it, it isn't all over <laughs> once the sun go, has disappeared from sight because you've got those few minutes where you've still got that lighting going on and one of the things I remember uh, very clearly actually is I was I'd spun around and I was leaning my camera on a, a gate post a uh, fence post taking these photographs and I look around and, and pretty much everyone has already gone and I thought well <laughs> you just miss these amazing amazing photographs so do think about that and again with the pre-dawn so before the sun is visible again you'll get colors depending on what's going on in the sky or where you are you might get some great silhouettes going on uh, so all sorts of things but these are the kind of things to think about because it can result in you coming up with a result that is a little bit different to what other, what people would usually shoot. So, um, yeah, they're probably they're, they're, so they're the main things to um, think about. 
So that's the podcast. Uh, I won't go through all of that again, but hopefully it's given you some ideas. Uh, the, the most important thing, I think, is knowing your gear and knowing the shortcomings of it, knowing how to get around those shortcomings, or if they are limiting what you're able to produce, th- that's the time I would suggest you think about uh, making a change to the gear that you're using. So I hope you found that useful and um, I will speak to you again on the next podcast. So bye for now. Just before I go, I want to let you know that there's a couple of ways you can support me if you feel so inclined. Uh, With the podcast, Buzzsprout, which is the the platform I use for all of my podcasts, they have a subscription model. So if you feel that you would like to subscribe, a few dollars, a few euros, whatever, um, to the podcast, that would be much appreciated. The other option is my Patreon membership. So if you'd like to become a patron and that starts at the price of a cup of coffee every month, you'll get access to exclusive material, behind the scenes material, photography tips, all this kind of stuff, depending on which tier you're at. So there is information available through my website and um, also on the, the written text to go with this podcast. So if you choose either one, thank you so much in advance and Whether or not you do, I hope you uh, continue to enjoy the podcasts and let other people know about them. Thank you very much. Bye for now.